The First Unitarian Society of Madison's Meeting House was completed in 1951. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's own church. He was a member of the congregation and his parents were founding members in 1879. The church is widely considered an icon of church architecture and in 2004 it got national landmark status. During his long career, Wright designed more than a thousand buildings. Of these, Wright awarded this seal of approval to about 50 of his favorites. It's a small ceramic plaque imitating the way Wright signed many of his drawings. The building is Usonian architecture, which means democratic design based on the freedom of the individual. Usonian architecture manifested itself here in large cantilevered overhangs, natural lighting with clear story windows, and radiant floor heating. Usonian architecture was not the only design factor. His early mentor, Louis Sullivan, said, form follows function. So Wright went one step farther and said, form is function, meaning that the two should be connected into a harmonious whole, which encompassed the blending in with nature and the use of natural materials undisguised, elements of organic architecture. Wright said, nature is all that we will ever see of the body of God. Your inner spirit, God, and nature are all one. These design choices are all not merely aesthetic, they're religious, and the meeting house is Wright's expression of both. Geometric shapes held meaning for Wright as well, who believed that all things are made up of basic shapes. For Wright, the square represents integrity, the circle universality, and the triangle structural strength, while an elongated triangle, a spire, signifies aspiration, the word he used to describe the soaring prowl. Before the building was built, church architecture in the United States typically consisted of rectangular boxes with steeples. Wright merged those shapes into that triangularly shaped soaring prowl of aspiration. Wright chose the triangle to signify the church as we are a community of seekers. There is no underlying dogma. As Unitarian Universalists, we do not profess to know one eternal truth, but only aspire to learn our own individual truths. Wright called the Meeting House his little church in the country, and it was. There were no buildings around it, and it's modest in scale, not overwhelming and quite comforting. Wright chose to call it the Meeting House to follow the Quaker spirit of humbleness and lack of ostentation. Some critics commend the Meeting House as the first church design based on the triangle, but I think an even more impactful design choice was putting clear glass around the pulpit. In an interview for CBS, after delivering the sermon in August of 1955, Wright said, If you get bored with what the preacher is saying, you can just look outside and enjoy beautiful nature, which at the time was a clear view to the lake. The beauty of the church did not come without great cost. It took five years for the church to be built. Wright originally estimated the cost of construction at $60,000 but the estimates came in at $350,000 to $700,000, a cost that the 150-member congregation of mostly students and professors could not afford. However, Wright was determined to build the church and found a young, inexperienced contractor, as he sometimes did, who was very anxious to work with him. As the contractor he found, Marshall Erdman, told the story, one day, out of the blue, he got a call to come out to Taliesin and meet Wright. Uh, so uh, it didn't take me long to get out to Spring Green. <laughs> <laughs> and I drove out there, and uh, there was Wesley Peters and Jean Masselink, his secretary. I say, Mr. Wright wants to see you. And uh, I walked into his, and he was there with his cane and cape and porcupine hat and just standing by his desk, and he looked me over and he said, he says, well, baby, how would you like to become famous? <laughs> Erdman later admitted that he had no way to bid the project, but he bid $102,000, and after considerable debate, the congregation gave the go-ahead. I must admit that of all the things I've done here, and it was, I never had more problems more worries on any project that I've ever worked on. 
and more concerned because this was life or death almost to me. Mm -hmm. At one point, Erdman, who had young children, cashed in his life insurance policy to continue the project. But Erdman said Wright made it all up to him and more with later projects. One of the larger headaches was the design of the roof. Wright originally designed the roof trusses to contain only two by four boards nailed together and was insistent that it be built without steel. Erdman and Wesley Peters, Wright's son-in-law and the site architectural manager, insisted that the main cross members be two by six boards. Later, when Wright left on a business trip, Erdman and Peters quickly had steel beams installed in the prow before Wright returned, not the wiser. Members of the congregation did everything they could to hold down the costs, including hauling 1,000 tons of dolomite from a quarry 30 miles away to save money. Those members earned the title of the Stone Haulers, a mark of distinction in the church forever after. Without the thousands of hours of labor from the congregation and Wright's apprentices, the church would have far exceeded the final cost of $220,000 and may never have been completed. Wright's foremost concern was how a building would affect the people who used it. He liked to quote the Chinese philosopher Lao Tse, the essence of any building is the space within. This can be seen in how Wright manipulated this space using varying ceiling heights to evoke a motion of compression and expansion moving from room to room, short entryways that explode into the expanse of the worship space. To eliminate the hierarchy of listeners subordinated to a speaker in a classroom style, the seating is configured so members of the congregation can see each other. All of Wright's church designs have some variation of this theme. Wright believed it built a sense of community. The importance of music to Wright can't be overstated. He said a symphony is an edifice in sound. When asked who the world's greatest architect is, one of his answers was Beethoven. Music critics agree that Beethoven was a very architectural composer. He took a theme and layered on it, just as Wright took a theme, the triangle in the case of the meeting house, and built on it. In the theme of unity, Wright said architecture, music, and mathematics are so closely linked they are virtually one. Achieving proper acoustics was, however, not perfect. Above the choir loft is a sound reflector, which Wright called a tympanum. It's an afterthought, but Wright ordered and personally supervised its installation. Wright was not satisfied with the sound from the choir loft. Without the reflector, it would simply go up and die in the prow. Past the worship space in the loggia is a collection of Japanese prints that Wright gave to the congregation. Wright was a collector and dealer in Asian art, and his favorites were the Japanese prints. These are by the Japanese artist Hiroshigi, who was considered the last great Yukie art master and date from the 1850s. Light from the floor-to-ceiling windows has faded them, but Wright would not be dismayed. He believed art should be seen and enjoyed. At the end of the loggia is the Gabler living room, named for Reverend Max Gabler, who was our minister for 35 years. It was originally intended to be a living room of a parsonage for the minister to live on site. But the minister who got the project started, Kenneth Patton, left before groundbreaking to take another position. The new minister, Roger Cairns, did not like Wright or the building and made it clear that he would not live in a parsonage on site. Realizing how the costs were adding up, the congregation deleted plans for the rest of the parsonage. The room now houses our faux bell, which used to hang from the top of the prow. Since the completion of the church, our congregation has fortunately grown from 150 members to 1,400. But unfortunately, we have outgrown Wright's original worship space. Was it possible to build a substantial new building on a lot of only four and a half acres without impinging on the national landmark? After a national search for architects, the congregation decided on Kubala Washatko Architects of Cedarburg, Wisconsin. Their design criteria were that the building had to blend with the meeting house to form a coherent whole. It had to have a strong geometric shape, but could not mimic the meeting house. 
and it must have a low profile so that attention remained on the landmark building. Kubala Washatko convened a national committee of right experts to approve of the design, which takes advantage of the fact that there's a steep slope on the south side of the property and built down to minimize its size as seen from the meeting house. The new building has a 525-seat auditorium as opposed to the meeting house's 200. The north wall is the minimum height allowed by today's building code. The green roof and the large bush-covered berm in front further minimize the appearance. The building also pays homage to the meeting house. The focus of the semicircle formed by the glass is the pulpit of the meeting house. Kubala Washatko and the First Unitarian Society won awards for the design. It is an environmentally friendly building inside and out. It is LEED, that is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, certified gold. Outside, it has a living roof planted with 13 different kinds of sedum, lighting which reduces light pollution, rain gardens, and swales to keep water contained on the site. There are 16 geothermal wells under the parking lot which furnish the heating and cooling, plus a large array of solar panels. The Unitarian Meeting House is one of Wright's most essential buildings. The prow stands as an icon to modern religious, Usonian, and organic architecture. It could not have been done without the determination of Wright, the congregation, and Marshall Erdman to create a physical symbol of aspiration for the world and passers-by to see. It stands strong here in Madison, Wisconsin, and we hope you come to visit, maybe stay a while. Now, I believe a home is much more a home for being a work of art. And I think until it is a work of art, it lacks the essential characteristics of a home. <laughs>